Good morning, students. Today is Saturday, 1 May 2021. Uh, the semester is winding down quickly. This will be our next to last lecture for the semester. Uh, sorry it's a little bit late. Uh, I had some things come up. One of my <clears throat> published, uh, one of my articles that's been submitted uh, needed to be proofread very quickly. So I had to do that yesterday. Anyway, this will be our second lecture of this week, and we have only one more next week. Uh, I expect that that will be put up on Monday. Now, Tuesday is the final day of class, but Monday will be our final lecture, assuming I get it up on Monday, which I plan to. And after that, there's nothing but the exam, which is on the 11th of May, and that's only 10 days from now. Okay, so today we're going to spend... Uh, some time discussing three additional prima facie duties that are described by David Ross. And we'll wrap things up in the final lecture with the final three duties. There are a total of seven. We've covered one of them already. Three today, three next time, and then we'll be done. Okay, what have we done so far? You now know what a prima facie duty is. We went over that in the most recent lecture. David Ross says that there are seven prima facie duties, and he gives them names. The names are fidelity, reparation, gratitude, justice, so, I'm sorry, beneficence, self-improvement, and non-maleficence. There's no particular order, but those are the order in which he present that's the order in which he presents them. Now, we've already covered the prima facie duty of fidelity. Remember, fidelity includes, as a component, what we might call the duty of veracity, which is truth-telling. You have a duty to tell people the truth whenever you enter into conversation with them. And whenever you write something that purports to be factual, such as a, a history, a work of history, you're not always required to tell the truth, and that's because sometimes the context is such that you are clearly not committed to the truth. If you're acting or writing a novel or any other kind of fiction, for example, or if you're kidding around with somebody, then of course you can say things that are false. So it all depends on the context and what the other people around you expect. If other people are expecting you to tell the truth, then you have a prima facie duty to do so. Now remember, these are prima facie duties, and that just means that they are duties unless and until some stronger duty uh, also applies, pointing in the other direction. So may you ever tell a lie? According to Ross, the answer is yes. There are situations in which it would be the right thing to do to lie. For example, suppose the and this is an actual case. Suppose during Nazi Germany, uh, you decided to harbor some Jews or some other persecuted group. Suppose one day the Nazis come knocking on your door and they ask you point blank, do you have any Jews in your house? Arguably, you should lie. I think most people would say you should lie to those Nazis. Right? That would be a justifiable lie because pretty clearly, the Nazis mean harm to the people you're harboring. So you have a conflict of duties. Remember, a conflict occurs when two or more prima facie duties apply and they point in different directions. So on the one hand, you are supposed to tell the truth, right? There's a prima facie duty of veracity. But at the same time, you have a prima facie duty of beneficence, which is doing things to help people. So you arguably should lie and hope that the Nazis go away and leave the people you're harboring alone. Okay, so there's a prima facie duty to tell the truth, but remember, Ross is no absolutist. He would never hold, like Kant does, that you must never lie. And that's one important difference between Kant and Ross. Both of them are deontologists, and what I mean by that is both of them reject consequentialism. And therefore, both of them reject utilitarianism because utilitarianism is a species of the genus consequentialism. 
So Kant and Ross reject consequentialism. They are called deontologists. And both of them think that duty is the primary concept of ethics. We've seen that already with Kant. Kant said you must always act in accordance with duty. And if you want your action to have moral worth, in addition to acting in accordance with duty, you must act with the motive of duty. You must do your duty for the sake of duty. You must be properly motivated in order for your act to be morally worthy. And now here comes David Ross much later, and Ross says that duty is the central concept of ethics. It's, it's just that for Ross, these duties are prima facie only, and that means they can be outweighed or overridden in certain situations. And many people are attracted to that. Many people who are deontologists and reject utilitarians, utilitarianism, they like Ross's theory because he's not an absolutist. Many people find it hard to stomach what Kant said about lying. Kant said you must never lie, no matter what the circumstances are. And for many people, that is unacceptable. That's too sweeping. So Ross is not an absolutist. All right, we went over the duty of fidelity. Let's turn now to the second duty, reparation. And I'm going to read, first of all, to begin our discussion, I'm going to read from this handout. This is a two-page handout. I have it on one sheet of paper. And what I did is I quoted Ross from his book, from chapter two of his book, uh, this long paragraph. And then on the back, I have some pithy formulations. So let's go back and read what Ross says about reparation. First of all, I'll go right back to the beginning. He says, some duties rest on previous acts of my own. In other words, something you did creates or triggers the duty. In the case of fidelity, what triggers the duty is the fact that you made a commitment. Had you not made the commitment, you wouldn't have had a duty. But given that you did make a commitment, you now have a duty. It's like magic. Right? You created the duty in yourself by making the commitment or in the case of veracity, by entering into conversation with others. The same is true for the second duty. Here's what Ross says. Now remember, Ross says, divides the first duty into two parts, 1A and 1B. So really, this is the second duty, but he, he calls it 1B. He says, uh, those resting on a previous wrongful act, these may be called the duties of reparation. Notice the word reparation is based upon the word repair. You know what it means to repair something. If your bicycle has become broken, you can repair it or take it into a shop and have it repaired for you for a fee. So turn the handout over or look at page two of it. And here's what I came up with as my pithy formulation. Under, under reparation, I say, rectify or repair your wrongs. And that's easy to remember. You can teach that to a fairly young child. You can say to the child, whenever you do something wrong, you have incurred or taken upon yourself a duty to repair it or make it right. And there are a lot of words for this in our language. Rectification, uh, repair, making amends. Uh, and so on. I'll give you some more in a moment. Notice that the first two duties are both backward-looking as opposed to forward-looking. Fidelity is backward-looking. It looks back in time. It says, because I did something in the past, I now have a duty. And the same is true for reparation. Because I did something in the past that was wrong, because I wronged somebody, I now have a duty to repair it to make good on it, to make it right again. Okay, so your, your, goal, your objective is to make amends. Your duty is to make amends. Now, at a bare minimum, making amends or repairing a wrong requires saying, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that's sufficient. I'm not saying that's enough. I'm not saying that's adequate, but it's a start. When you wrong somebody, including something as, si si 
as simple as stepping on someone's toe in a crowded elevator. What would you say? It's crowded. You aren't, you, you're not looking down to see where people's feet are. So as you move your feet, you happen to step on someone's toe. And the natural thing to say at that point is, I'm sorry. You look at the person whose toe you stepped on and say, I'm sorry. Or maybe you would whisper, sorry. Okay, that's a way to rectify a wrong, right? To make amends for something. Another way is to say, pardon me. It's a very common expression. Pardon me. Uh, if you bump into somebody, you might say, pardon me, right? Uh, what you're doing is asking for forgiveness, really. You're saying, please pardon me. I didn't mean to do it and I won't do it again, so please forgive me or pardon me. Uh, other people, students over the years, have, have told me how to say I'm sorry in various languages. Uh, in Spanish, I, I think I recorded it incorrectly when I typed it up. I think the word is perdón. Am I right? Perdón. If this were a classroom, maybe somebody could correct me. I think it's spelled P-E-R-D-O-N, and it's, if I'm Remembering this correctly, it's Spanish for I'm sorry, pardon me. Um, in Latin, you can say mea culpa. You've probably heard that. It's kind of a popularized expression. Mea culpa means my fault. Right? Mea, me, culpa, fault. Uh, someone told me a while back, mi culpa is Spanish for mea culpa or I'm sorry, my fault, I'm, I mean. Um, interesting, have you ever heard the expression my bad? People say, oh, my bad. When I first heard that many years ago, I thought, oh, that's a terrible corruption of the language. But it's grown on me over the years. I hear it, and I've actually said it myself. It's a kind of humorous way to announce or to proclaim that you've done something wrong. My bad, I shouldn't, meaning I shouldn't have done that, and it was wrong. Maybe it's trivial, but <clears throat> still, you're <clears throat> apologizing or... Um, proclaiming that you were at fault. My bad. And there are some other ones I've gotten. Uh, a student who knew Vietnamese told me there's a term Sin Loi, and she told me how to pronounce it, Sin Loi. And I also have a Ch Chinese or Mandarin statement. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled H-S-E-I, and the second word is also H-S-E-I. Um, so however you pronounce that, I'm told that that's how you say I'm sorry in Chinese, or perhaps it was Mandarin, I can't remember which. Now, here are some terms to describe making amends. We can use the term apology. I issued an apology to the person I wronged. You can, you can say I atoned for my sins. Now that's a religious way of talking, but you could even use it in morality. I'm atoning for my wrongs, for my moral sins, if you will. We sometimes talk about expiating one's sins, expiation, repentance. You repent your wrongs or your sins. You seek forgiveness. When you wrong someone, you not only, exp you not only try to repair it, but you ask for forgiveness. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to do it. Uh, I promise it won't happen again. Please forgive me. And forgiveness, if granted, it may not be granted. Some people are unwilling to forgive those who wrong them. But, it, but many people are willing to forgive. And when they do, they're putting things back in what we might call the status quo ante, the situation before the wrong was committed. So there's a little bit of a process. Somebody... A, let this be person A and this be B. A wrongs B. Uh, A then asks, A apologizes to B and asks for forgiveness. B forgives A and they're back on the same terms they were initially. Sometimes it's just that easy. Asking for and receiving forgiveness from the wronged person. Other terms are penance doing penance for your sins or crimes or wrongs. Notice, sin is a term drawn from religion, crime is a term drawn from law, and wrong is a term drawn from morality. Right? So you could do penance for any of those. Redemption is redeeming yourself in the eyes of others. 
If you've wronged someone, you, you may perform some actions that are designed to redeem you, to put you back in the good graces of the people you have wronged or the person you have wronged. Sometimes, and this is a term from law, we compensate people we have wronged. It's called compensation. The purpose of the tort law system is to compensate people who have been wronged by others. So if you, uh, through your own negligence, do something that harms me or damages my property, I can sue you in a civil court, and if I'm successful, I will receive a sum of money from you as compensation for my injuries. And the injuries could mean, could involve anything from medical expenses that I had to pay because of the injury I suffered at your hands. It could include pain and suffering, which the law tries to quantify. It could include lost work. What if you injured me and I couldn't work for a month? I've lost a lot of wages or salary, and you may be required by law to compensate me for it, to pay me the sum of money that I would have earned had I been able to work. Um, it, what, if it, what if I incurred medical expenses, out-of-pocket medical expenses? You would be required to compensate me for that. So the civil law is designed, at least the tort law system is designed to make people whole again, to compensate them for the wrongs that they have suffered at other people's hands. Sometimes the law uses the term restitution. That's often used in criminal law, believe it or not. Suppose someone steals something from me that's worth $1,000, God forbid, but it could happen. If someone steals something from me for $1,000, I will file charges with the police and seek to have you prosecuted and punished for the theft. The court might order, in addition to punishment, the court might order as part of the punishment restitution which means you will be ordered to give the $1,000 that you stole from me back to me to make me whole again. So criminal law makes use of a concept called restitution, which is analogous to compensation from the civil law or tort system. And there's a term called contrition. People who have wronged others often are contrite, C-O-N-T-R-I-T-E. They express contrition uh, for their wrongdoing. Okay? A contrite person is someone who knows that he or she did wrong and has a, the appropriate feelings and expresses those feelings. Right? I'm contrite because of um, what I did. A student told me many years ago about a TV show you may have heard of I still haven't tracked it down, believe it or not. I've always been meaning to for many years. The show is My Name is Earl. And I'm told, it sounds fascinating to me, maybe I'll try to find it on my um, television, on my cable system somewhere. But apparently the plot was there was a man named Earl, and I may have this a little bit off, but he came into a sum of money, maybe he won the lottery or something, and instead of spending the money on himself, he, uh, he set out to um, do good deeds for the people he had wronged in, in his past. It sounds like an interesting concept. Um, I think it's somewhat of a comedy, maybe, but I'd like to see it anyway. And so if, that's, if I've got the show correct, then this man, Earl, is trying to repair the wrongs that he did. Now, is money always the solution? It can be. Sometimes when you've wronged somebody, you, you can make it up or compensate for it with, by giving some money to that person. But don't think that money is the only way to repair a wrong. You can repair a wrong in many different ways. You can say thank you. I'm sorry, not thank you. That'll come later. Uh, I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Please forgive me. Okay, so you can say the right words. Then, instead of giving money, which you may not have, you can do some services for that person. Is there something I can do for you to help you? Uh, maybe the person is uh, putting in a garden and it's a lot of work. You can volunteer to help that person uh, dig up the ground, plant the seeds, and so on. Maybe you'll make a friend uh, out of it. That's happened before. 
Okay, and my final comment on this topic is reparations. Have you heard that term? There's a lot of talk these days about reparations. Now, these are not so much acts of individuals, but acts of a, a whole country, a political unit, a political body. Uh, now, if you look back in American history, there are certain groups of people who were wronged by the government. Uh, for I'll just name a, a few. Maybe the original wrong was slavery. Right? The government facilitated and enabled and sometimes participated in slavery, human chattel slavery based upon race or skin color. And so there's talk these days of reparations from the descendants of slave owners or people generally through taxation to the descendants of the slaves, people who were enslaved in this country. And it's, a, it's an idea that's becoming talked about more and more. And maybe one day Congress will enact into law a bill that provides for reparations. And I don't know what it might look like. I don't know how you would go about proving that you descended from slaves, but there probably is a way to do, to do that. I don't know who will do the repairing. Will the money come from the general uh, revenue of the, gov the U.S. government? which means wherever the government takes in money, some of that money will be used as reparations, <coughs> excuse me, or will it be targeted? Will there be some attempt to make the descendants of slave owners make the reparations to the descendants of, of uh, slaves? So that's an interesting concept. Another example from American history is the treatment of native peoples. And I'll, have, I'll give you one example. The Lakota people, or what's commonly known as the Sioux, Sioux Indians, um, they prized the Black Hills of southwestern South Dakota, what's now southwestern South Dakota. The Black Hills was considered a sacred place to them. And in 1874, an expedition led by George Armstrong Custer, you've probably heard of him, went into the Black Hills to explore. Um, and during the course of that expedition, gold was supposedly discovered. And the news went out across the country and people flocked to the Black Hills in great numbers. The, the government tried to stop them for a while and eventually just gave up. There were too many gold seekers pouring in. And the Sioux, of course, were outraged by this. And it led to the, the Great Sioux War of 1876. And perhaps ironically, George Armstrong Custer was killed at the Battle of the Little Bighorn on June 25th, 1876. Um, so the Sioux felt dispossessed of their homeland and this very sacred place because the whites, the whites eventually dispossessed them of it and drove them off. Now, the Sioux, who have resented this for a long time, the Sioux, in, early in the 20th century, hired attorneys to file claims for them in their behalf to try to recover the Black Hills. And the lawsuit, and I read a whole book about the lawsuit. It was fascinating. The lawsuit took decades. And there were lots of false starts. They would file in the Court of Civil Claims, and after several years, the court would throw it out. Then they would refile in some other court. Eventually, they got into the right court system and it started moving up the appellate ladder. And guess what? In 1980, the United States Supreme Court, in a famous ruling, ruled that the U.S. government had wronged the Sioux, had violated a treaty with the Sioux Indians, and took away their Black Hills land. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Sioux were entitled to a sum of money as compensation. I think it was initially $18 million, 1980. Now, you may be wondering what happened. The Sioux tribe refused to take the money. They said, we don't want money. That's not what this is all about. We never wanted money. We don't want money. We're not gonna take the money. We could use the money, of course, but we don't want money. That's not what we want. We want the land back. We want the Black Hills back. And to this day, this is 41 years later after the Supreme Court ruling, 
To this day, the Sioux have not taken the money. And guess what? The money has been earning interest all these years. And last I heard, the, the money owed to the Sioux is, a, is approaching a billion dollars. A billion dollars. Now, if you've ever been to a reservation, you know that life is very hard for many tribes, including the Sioux. And their educational system is poor. Their housing is poor. And many, they have a lot of social problems. Uh, the money could be used for a lot of good purposes. And it shows you the, the principled nature of the Sioux that they still refuse to take the money. So the government has tried to compensate the Sioux monetarily for the wrong done to them back in 1868 when the treaty was signed. Um, and the Sioux have refused to take it. It'll be interesting to see how what happens. Uh, I don't know, maybe it won't be resolved in my lifetime. But there could be, uh, the Sioux could meet one day and perhaps take a vote of tri tribal members and decide finally to take the money. Um, but maybe not. Maybe um, by the time I die, they will still not have done so. Interesting case. And also, during World War II, uh, a great many Japanese Americans, American citizens of Japanese descent, were interned, put into camps, internment camps, because they were thought to be un, uh, disloyal to the United States during the war. And there's talk of um, making reparations to them by the U.S. government for the wrong done to them. Remember, these are American citizens who just happen to be of Japanese descent. And the assumption was made that because they're of Japanese descent, they must be disloyal, or there's a high risk of disloyalty. So that it was thought that it wouldn't be... Uh, safe to leave them in their communities. They were rounded up and taken to secure locations. And I'm sure you can read all about it if you, if you want to. Okay, so that's the duty of reparation. I've given you, a, I've elaborated on it. I've given a number of examples. Uh, reparation can be done by, by an individual who has wronged someone. And it can also be done by a political entity, such as the United States government because it has wronged some person or group of people, like an Indian tribe. Okay, let's move on. We have two more to do today. Uh, let's look at the duty of gratitude. Go back to Ross. Here's what he says. Now, he calls this duty number two, but it's really the third one. He says, some of these, some of these prima facie duties rest on previous acts of other men. Now, we could say men or women. He clearly meant men in the generic sense, but many people find that kind of use of the masculine pronouns generically to be offensive and uninclusive. So I'm going to add women there because I'm positive he meant that. Some prima facie duties rest on previous acts of other men or women, i.e. services done by them to me. These may be loosely described as the duties of gratitude. Okay, gratitude. It's related to words like grateful, being, being grateful, or ingrate, being ungrateful. So if you turn the handout over, look at what I wrote as a pithy statement. I simply say repay kindnesses. Repay kindnesses. So when somebody has done a kindness for you, you have incurred a duty to repay it. Right? to express gratitude or to show gratitude in some way. Now, this is a backward-looking duty as well. Right? The, all three of the duties we've covered so far, uh, which are fidelity, uh, reparation, and now gratitude, all three of them look back. And because someone else did a kind thing to you, you now have a duty. Uh, to express gratitude, a duty of gratitude, Ross calls it. Now, the simplest and easiest way to express gratitude, as you can probably guess, is to say thank you. In other languages, you can say merci, that's French, gracias, uh, which is Spanish, grazie, which is Italian, or you could be explicit about it. You could say to the person who has benefited you or shown a kindness to you, thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for what you've done. 
I really appreciate it. I'm sure you've said those words. You've probably had those words said to you. It, it warms the cockles of your heart, doesn't it? When somebody says, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. <clears throat> you, you didn't have to do it, but you went out of your way to help me, and I certainly appreciate it. Okay? That's an expression of gratitude. People who, people who have a duty of gratitude, but don't express it or show it, are said to be ingrates. Remember the case of the young man and his grandfather we discussed earlier? It's, a, it's in Feldman's chapter on um, act utilitarianism. Uh, the young man, we were told, was callous and ungrateful. He was an ingrate. His grandfather had done a great deal for him, and he didn't appreciate it. He wasn't grateful for it. What an ingrate, we would say. And that's a bad thing to be. Uh, if, you, if you owe a debt of gratitude or a duty of gratitude, don't be an ingrate. Make sure you show your gratitude to the one who benefited you. Now, is it enough to say thank you? Sometimes it is. If someone does something trivial for you, something minor, then saying thanks or I appreciate that is probably adequate. But if what if somebody saved your life? What if a stranger who had no duty to you saved your life? Uh, I'm sure that simply saying thank you would be it would feel and probably be inadequate. I mean, you want to do more than that, wouldn't you? I would. Uh, the person uh, spared the most precious thing you own, which is your life, the basis of everything else that you value, the thing that gives meaning to all of your other activities. And so you would want to go beyond that. Um, how might you express gratitude? In some of the ways that we talked about a moment ago in connection with reparation. Money is sometimes a way to express gratitude to others. If someone has done you a kindness, you can reciprocate. You, well, maybe that's not the right word because you're not showing kindness. You are expressing gratitude for a kindness that was done to you. And so you could buy someone a gift. That's often a fitting thing to do. If someone has done you a kindness, you can send some flowers or some fudge or some other uh, confection, something sweet, which almost everybody likes. And some people deny themselves these simple pleasures of eating sweets. Uh, so if you sent some fudge, I'm thinking of fudge because Mother's Day is coming up and I'm thinking of buying some fudge from Murdoch's on Mackinac Island in Michigan uh, to send to my mother for Mother's Day. And I know she likes fudge and probably doesn't get it that often. So I, I'm thinking of fudge. It's a nice little uh, treat for people. I'm not sending it to my mother out of gratitude so much as to celebrate Mother's Day for her. But that leads me to a topic that has to do with parents. Remember earlier in the course when we were talking about super erogatory action? And of course, I hope you remember what that means. A supererogatory act is an act that is not required, it's not obligatory, but it's morally good. So it's an act that goes above and beyond the call of duty. Now, when we discussed that, I talked about parenting. And I said that there are logically three types of parents, right? Some parents do their duty and nothing more. They feed their children adequately, they house them adequately, they clothe them adequately, they see to it that they have an, an adequate education, they see to it that they have adequate medical care, but these parents I'm imagining don't go beyond that. They do everything required of a parent morally and no more. We can call them erogatory parents. Their duty, they do their duty and nothing more. Now, we can also talk about sub-erogatory parenting. Sub means below. So there are, unfortunately, parents who don't do uh, their duty with respect to their children. Their, their parenting is inadequate. They're, they don't properly feed their children. They don't properly clothe or house them or educate them or see to it that they have adequate medical care. And sadly, there are parents who not only neglect their children, but sometimes abuse them. So we can think of that as bad parenting. These are parents who are failing to do their duty as parents. And fi <coughs> finally, there are super-erogatory parents, P 
parents who go above and beyond their parental duty. And maybe some of you had parents like that. I, I did. Uh, these are parents who don't just do their duty, but they take their kids on vacations. Now, I don't think anyone would argue that taking kids on vacation is part of a parent's duty, but many parents do it. And children have a wonderful time, whether they're going to Disneyland or, in my case, t taking long camping trips. In 1964, when I was seven, my parents, and we lived in Michigan, loaded up a Buick with um, tents and sleeping bags and stoves and everything, and we drove, uh, my parents and my two brothers and I, drove from Michigan to California and back, eventually back. And we didn't go straight there. Uh, we traveled, we went all around, we saw all the historical sites, we saw the Custer Battlefield in, north, in southeastern Montana, we saw the Hoover Dam, and many, many other wonderful things. And as a seven-year-old, it was a life-transforming experience for me. I immediately fell in love with the American West, and it's still an ongoing love affair. I became a history buff. On a daily basis, I'm reading books about Custer and Native Americans and gen American history generally, world history. I love history, and I fell in love with it that summer when I was seven. So my life has been transformed beyond measure by that trip and other trips we took when I was a child. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing what my parents did for me. I'm so grateful for it. My brothers, I can't speak for them, but I assume they're also grateful. Um, what do you do when, you've had, when you had parents or have parents who did things that were above and beyond the call of duty, that made their children's lives wonderful? Notice what that means. Full of wonder, enjoyment, pleasure. And there were other things my parents did. We had snowmobiles, and they were great, a lot of fun in the winter in Michigan, driving around. We had 20 acres of land, so um, my three brothers and I got to play in the woods all year round, explore and make trails, build tree houses, raise animals. What a wonderful childhood. My mother was a great cook and loved cooking, and I remember I can hear her voice today uh, saying, on a, like on a Saturday morning, what do you boys want today? Cake, cookies, pie, cinnamon rolls. And whatever we chose, she made it fresh and hot. Uh, what a wonderful childhood I have. And I've come to realize since then that not every person had a wonderful childhood like I did, which makes me feel even more grateful. How lucky was I to have caring, loving parents who made my life so happy. So what do you do, to bring this back to Ross, what do you do if you happen to have parents who were super erogatory, as I did. Well, according to Ross, you have a duty of gratitude toward them. You need to express your gratitude. And not just one time by buying a big gift for your parents or maybe buying a, a cruise or something, to, a, a air, airplane tickets to some uh, exotic location where they could enjoy themselves. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that but you should express your gratitude on an ongoing basis, right? Tell, you, tell your mother and father, um, or in my case, my mother and stepfather, how much you love them. Let them know. Uh, talk to them about all the wonderful things that you remember from your childhood. I'm sure that will uh, make them very, very happy to, uh, to realize that they were good parents, that they cared about their children's happiness, and so on. It will warm the cockles of their hearts. Believe me. So as soon as this lecture is over, you call your mom or your dad, your stepmother, your stepfather, and you let them know how much you appreciate all the wonderful things they did for you. Because I'm pretty sure they went above and beyond the call of duty uh, probably many times for you. Okay, uh, here, there are some interesting complications. We're talking about the duty of gratitude. Do you have a duty of gratitude toward people who benefit you, but only when they're doing their duty? For example, a lifeguard has a duty to save the lives of people on his or her beach. That's part of the job description. That, that lifeguard is duty-bound. 
What if one day you're struggling in the surf and a lifeguard has to come rescue you? Is gratitude appropriate there? Well, it's not so clear. On the one hand, the lifeguard was doing his or her duty. So you might say, well, all you did was your duty. You didn't go beyond your duty to save my life, so I'm not going to even thank you. Um, but on the other hand, the person did benefit you significantly, perhaps by saving your life. So maybe some amount of gratitude is called for there. I think in general, though, the general rule is that gratitude is appropriate only when the person who benefited you was acting above and beyond the call of duty. But as the years have gone on, as I've thought about this more often, I've come to conclude that there are two situations in which someone's doing his or her duty in a way that benefits you does create a duty of gratitude in you. And here they are. The first one is, what if most people are not doing their duty, but someone does? Don't you feel as though you should express gratitude for it? Now, here's an example. I used to be a runner, a competitive, serious runner. I'm now um, back to just cycling. I used to do both. Now I'm just a exclusively a cyclist. But I remember many training runs when I was running in my neighborhood, training 20-mile training runs for a marathon or 10-mile runs, 6-mile runs, whatever. I'm running on the residential streets. And there were times when I came up to a T intersection and there was a stop sign for the vehicles coming into the T. Now that means they have a legal duty to stop and let other cars, bikes, and pedestrians get through before they come into the intersection. There, there were many times when, as I ran through the intersection, someone didn't stop at the stoplight, or stop sign, I should say. It just came right on through, and sometimes it it scared me because I wasn't sure whether I'd be struck. Uh, at a minimum, it disrupted my rhythm, so I had to slow down or veer out of my path. It was very rude for people to do that. Now, one day, when I was running through that intersection where lots of people had not stopped and let me go through, one day, a car stopped at the, at the stop sign and waited for me to get through. And I found myself waving in acknowledgement, as though, as if to say, thank you. And then almost immediately I felt sheepish about it. Like, wait a minute, why did I express thanks or gratitude to that person when all that person was doing was his or her duty? And it troubled me that I spontaneously said thank you when the person was just doing his or her legal duty. As I thought about it, I came to the conclusion that my gratitude was appropriate. And I think the reason was most people at that stop sign didn't do their duty. They were scoff laws, right? They were supposed to stop and they didn't. When this one person came along and stopped, it felt as though the person were going above and beyond the call of duty because the person was doing something that was extraordinary, something that most people weren't doing. So when most people aren't doing their duty and someone does, gratitude toward that person does seem appropriate. Or so I thought and so I still think. And you can decide for yourself whether that's appropriate. The second situation where I think gratitude is appropriate, where someone is just doing his or her duty, is when doing the duty is onerous or difficult or dangerous or costly in some way. So sometimes doing your duty is comes at a cost to you. So suppose someone does his or her duty and it benefits me and I discover that it was very difficult for that person to do his or her duty. I may feel that gratitude toward that person is appropriate. Let's see whether I can think of an example of this. Suppose I lend somebody some money. Uh, suppose it's an acquaintance, a colleague or something. I lend someone $20. And the, the, uh, the plan was this person will repay me on Friday when the person gets paid. Okay? Uh, Friday comes along 
and the person is having a difficult time getting the $20. Maybe other things came up, an unexpected bill or some unexpected expense. And it's going to be difficult for the person to come up with the $20. Suppose I later discover that in order to get that $20 to repay me on time, that person had to do something onerous or difficult. I had to stay after work one evening for several hours and miss the World Series or something like that. When I discover that the person who repaid me the $20 had to do something like give up watching a World Series game that he or she wanted to watch, I may say, well, I'm sorry that happened. Thank you for repaying the money. Now, the person was only doing his or her duty in repaying me the $20. But I think gratitude is appropriate because the person, uh, because doing the duty was costly to that person. So, in thinking about this duty over the years, I've come up with a couple of reasons why sometimes you should express gratitude even to people who are doing their duty, right? When few others are doing their duty and when doing one's duty is costly to the person doing it. Okay, um, what else do I want to say here? Uh, a couple more examples. Um, Veterans Day, Labor Day, Memorial Day, Thanksgiving Day. These are national holidays in the United States. And what do they signify? Veterans Day is when we stop and express gratitude toward people who have served in the military. Veterans Day. Labor Day is when we pause and express gratitude toward those who do work, those who work, including people who work in dirty or dangerous jobs. Uh, on Memorial Day, we pause to remember and express gratitude toward those who died in service of their country. On Thanksgiving Day, we pause to express gratitude to, well, if you're religious, you probably thank God for the bounty that we enjoy here in this country and that you personally enjoy. You may express on Thanksgiving Day gratitude toward your compatriots, people, your fellow citizens who, like you, are involved in a joint project and who all work and we share the burdens of social life and we share the fruits of social life as well. So you kind of pause and express thanks to your God, to your fellow citizens, to anyone involved in giving you the comfortable, pleasant life that you have. So national holidays are a way of expressing gratitude. Um, some people pray to God and thank God, not just on a holiday like Thanksgiving, but on a daily basis. Um, I often watch sports on television. Sometimes after a race or a match or game is over, the, they interview the athletes, and sometimes they thank God. Um, now, there are way, two ways to interpret that. Uh, some people belittle them and say, oh, God cared who won the 100-meter dash? God favored you rather than your competitors? I don't think that's what's being suggested. When you thank God for your victory, you're not implying that God favored you over the others. I think you're thanking God because you, you're grateful to God for giving you the ability to be able to compete and sometimes win in a race that's important to you. Uh, so you know, there's a cynical way to look at people who thank God for their victory, but there's a non-cynical way as well. And one more example, this is a personal example. When I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona, I had a number of terrific professors, wonderful people. Um, my dissertation director was Joel Feinberg, who was already quite famous when I went out to Arizona to study under him. And he ended up serving on all my committees. I, I asked him, and he always said yes right away. He was never reluctant, and I'm grateful for that. And he ended up supervising my PhD dissertation and eventually writing letters of recommendation for me so that I could get this wonderful job that I have at UTA. So I'm eternally grateful to him for everything he did for me. Now, one of the many things he did for me that 
went beyond the call of duty was inviting me to his home on occasion. And I remember going up into the foothills and meeting his wife, Betty, and other people who were there. Uh, it was, I was just a graduate student. It made me feel important and wanted uh, by the department. Um, and one other things he did for me, this one in particular stands out. After I took one of my big exams, it was an oral exam in front of Joel Feinberg and probably at least two others. It's very tense. You go into a room, you've studied hard probably for months, and you don't know what questions they will ask you, but you've got to be on your toes and you can only hope that you answer their questions adequately and that they pass you because it's always possible that they will fail you. And if they fail you, then that means you can no longer proceed in the department toward your degree. You might end up just getting a master's degree and then you're out. They, they say, in effect, we're not going to allow you to proceed in the PhD program. And that, that would be devastating for, for almost every, anybody who experienced it. So on one of the, after one of these exams, I was sitting home in my apartment. I knew I passed the exam. Okay, because they tell you that as soon as they come out of the room. They send you out of the room when the exam's over, and you wait nervously in the office until someone comes out of the room. And I remember Ron Milo came out, and he had a smile on his face. And I knew that was okay. And he, he probably wouldn't be smiling if they had failed me. So he shook my hand. The others came out, or I went back in, and, and it was a very happy situation. And I was happy happier than any of them, I assure you. Okay, I went home that evening, still glowing in the success. The phone rang. I picked it up. It was Joel Feinberg. And he said, in fact, I wrote it up. If you'll bear with me for a moment, I have it here somewhere. He wrote it up. I wrote it up after he called because it, it was so shocking to me to receive this call, I wanted to memorialize it. So here's what I wrote in my journal. This is 1987. Tonight, as I was eating at my desk, the telephone rang. To my surprise, it was Joel Feinberg. Listen, he said, in all the hustle and bustle after your exam, I'm not sure that we told you just how pleased we were with your exams, both written and oral. You did extremely well and I wanted you to know that. Now here's me talking. I was speechless. Well, thank you, Joel, I stammered. That makes me feel good. Obviously, I was content to just pass, but it's nice to know that I did better than that. Apparently, that's all Joel wanted to say. So we said goodbye, and I went back to eating. Can you believe it? I wrote in my journal. Well, it, I went on from there, but that was a contemporaneous report of what happened. I wrote that up within a day of it happening. Now, let's talk about this in terms of Ross's prima facie duty of gratitude. Uh, I later, once I received my degree and went off to teach at Texas A&M, I, I had a one-year job at A&M and then came to UTA, and I'm now finishing my 32nd year at UTA. So anyway, I... When I went off to teach at Texas A&M, I had to leave Tucson, obviously, where Joel lived. I wrote to him a long letter every year on his birthday. It was a birthday letter, but it was bringing him up to date with what had been going on in my career and in my personal life. And he always wrote back to me. It was very nice. He, got, he wrote a long, nice longhand letter um, every year. So we kept in touch for year after year. Now, in one of my letters to him, I said, by the way, Joel, I want to thank you so much for everything you did for me when I was your student. I appreciate it more than you know. In his next letter, he wrote back and said, Keith, your gratitude is inappropriate. After all, I was only doing my duty. I was stunned and ashamed. I was stunned because I didn't expect it. I was ashamed because I thought to myself, he's right. He was my professor. He was being paid to do all the things he did for me. And I held the view then that 
when someone is doing his or her duty, gratitude is not appropriate. And yet I had expressed gratitude to him. So I felt like, oh, how stupid am I to express gratitude to someone who was only doing his duty? But you know what? The more I thought about it, the more I believe, came to believe that he was wrong and I was right. Because it seems clear to me when I look back on my five years in Tucson, it seemed clear that there were many occasions where he went above and beyond the call of duty, such as inviting me to his home, which made me feel important and significant. Um, that was clearly above and beyond the call of duty. Surely no professor has a duty to invite graduate students to his or her house uh, to, a, to a gathering of others, including philosophers. And there were many other things, such as that phone call I just recorded, I told you about. Do you think Joel Feinberg had a, a duty of any kind to call me up that evening and tell me that I had done well in the exam? There's no way that that was within the scope of his duty, and yet he did it. And it was a wonderful thing uh, that he did. It made me feel so good about myself because had he not called me, I would never have known whether I just scraped by on the exams or did better than that. And to, to my grave, I will always know that I did well. And that's a wonderful feeling to have. Uh, so the reason I came to believe that Joel was wrong and I was right is that in my judgment, he had gone above and beyond the call of duty many times. And that's what I was expressing gratitude for. In his view, the things that he did for me were just part of his duty. And that's why he said that gratitude was inappropriate. So he and I had a dispute. He thought that the things, that some of the things he had done, he thought that all of the things he had done were within his duty. I disagree, and I think some of what he did, a lot of what he did was above and beyond the call of his duty. And that's where the gratitude is appropriate for those things. So forgive me, Joel. He, he died, by the way, in, in 2004. Forgive me, Joel, for disagreeing with you, but I think this is a case where the student gets the better of the teacher. And maybe it shows something about Joel as a person, the fact that he thinks that things that are pretty clearly to most people above and beyond the call of duty, for him it was all just part of his duty. He, he was magnanimous. That means large soul. He was so magnanimous that he saw things as his duty that most others saw as above and beyond duty. And that's partly why he's so beloved a figure. He was not only a great philosopher, but he was a great person. And to, to this day, I've never heard anybody say anything even remotely disparaging about him as a person or as a philosopher. How blessed was I, a country boy from Michigan, to go study under him, learn from him, and just be around him. It was a wonderful thing. All right, let's turn to the third duty for the day, justice. This duty is also backward looking. So we've had four duties now. All four so far are backward looking. They look back at the past, they notice that something has happened, and then the duty comes about as a result of those things happening. The final three duties that we'll be discussing next time are all forward looking. So we'll save that for the final lecture. Let's talk about justice. Justice is quite simply giving others their due. Maybe we should go back to Ross and then we'll look at some of my examples. Here's what Ross says about justice. It's his third duty, but really the fourth. Number three, some prima facie duties rest on the fact or possibility of a distribution of pleasure or happiness or the means thereto, such as money, which is not in accordance with the merit of the persons concerned. In such cases, there arises a duty to upset or prevent such a distribution. These are the duties of justice. Okay, turn it over. Look at the pithy formulation. This is me talking. 
The duty of justice says give others their due or give others what they deserve. And I go on to say this includes the following. I'll come to that in a moment. So what? how do you give others their due? Well, Ross seems to be saying that in all of your actions with respect to others, you should try to find a proportion between the merit of the person in question and the happiness or pleasure of that person. So if someone has done something meritorious, highly meritorious, that means if someone has done something very good morally, then you should try to see to it that that person is very happy. High merit is proportional to high, a high degree of happiness. So it's a good and just world when good people get rewarded for it in proportion to their goodness. It's also a matter of justice when people who lack merit, people who have demerits, way down here at the bottom of the scale, when they are punished for it or when they suffer for it, when they're made unhappy or experience pain. So imagine two scales. There's the merit scale and there's the happiness scale. Justice consists in perpendicular lines all the way down between these two scales. So people at the top, whoops, this is the, I guess this is the uh, merit scale. People who, who have a high degree of merit way up here, go straight across, they deserve a high degree of happiness. People with, a, with somewhat less merit, go straight across, they deserve somewhat less happiness. People with a low degree of merit, way down here, go across, they deserve a low degree of happiness. Maybe they even deserve to have pain inflicted or some, some amount of punishment. So justice says, give people what they deserve. Good deeds deserve reward, bad deeds deserve punishment. In all of your dealings with others, take pains to see to it that they get what they deserve. Give others their due and make sure it's proportionate. Okay, make, now, let's go back to those two scales, okay? Merit and happiness. What would a diagonal line look like? Either this one or this one. A diagonal line would represent an injustice. For example, what if someone who is meritorious is suffering? That's, that's unjust. They deserve to be happy and yet they're miserable. What about someone who is evil or who lacks merit to a high degree is flourishing and happy? That's unjust. Now, our world, unfortunately, is unjust. Good people suffer, bad people flourish. That's just a fact of our lives. Sometimes justice is done Sometimes good people do get rewarded, and we feel it's a fitting outcome. It's just. It's fair. Sometimes bad people get their comeuppance. Right? Criminals get punished. Not always, but sometimes. And we should feel good about that when it happens. You got your due. You got what you deserved. Okay? So there's both justice and injustice. Justice is when people receive their due, and injustice is when they receive something more or less than what they're due. And what this duty of justice says is, to the extent that it's in your power, do justice. If you're a teacher, for example, see to it that grades are assigned in, on the basis of merit. And the merit is a reflection of your performance on various tasks, such as the exams in this course. So, Here's an example of me acting justly with respect to you. I've announced early in the course, the first day, and on the syllabus, what the criteria are for receiving an A, a B, a C, and so forth. The criterion for an A is you receive an A in the course if and only if your final score in the course is 90 or higher. So what if someone received a score of 90 or higher and received an A? Have I done justice to that person? Yes, you got what you deserved in accordance with the rules that are laid out in the course and that everyone knew about. 
Um, what if someone who got a score of 90 or higher received a B or worse? That's unjust. I've treated you unjustly. Right? I didn't give you what you deserve in accordance with my rules. What if someone got, uh, got a score of 88 and received an A in the course? Strictly speaking, that's an injustice. But it could happen nonetheless, because I've told you that, I think I've told you that at the end of the semester, if your final score is, say, 89, chances are very good you'll end up with an A. Now, maybe that's not required by justice, but it is an expression of mercy on my part. I'm showing mercy on you. You came very close to an A, and I'm going to give you an A anyway. So, um, strictly though, that's unjust, because I didn't give you what you deserve. You deserve a B if you got an 89, but I may give you an A anyway. Okay? It's like when a judge uh, shows mercy or leniency on someone. By the way, if I do give you an A when your final score was 89, you have incurred what? You've incurred a debt of gratitude toward me. Now, I'm not asking you to express your gratitude, but just to apply what we learned already today, if I show mercy on you and give you an A when you deserve only a B, um, I've gone beyond, above and beyond the call of duty, and that's when gratitude is appropriate. Now, I'm not asking you to send me an email and say, thank you so much for giving me an A, even though I got an 89 in the course. I'm just using it to illustrate the point. Now, I go on to explain in my lecture notes different aspects of justice, and I'm going to give a kind of a running example. Here they are, five aspects of justice. The first aspect is don't act unjustly. And this means don't bring about unjust distributions of pleasure or happiness or the means thereto. So don't do any unjust acts. So, for example, don't cheat. If you cheat in an athletic competition or an academic task, if you cheat, you are trying to get something for nothing. You're trying to get something other than what you deserve. You're breaking the rules in order to get more than you deserve. And, and so the prima facie duty of justice says, don't do that. Don't cheat. Right? You're, trying, you're trying to bring about an unjust distribution of happiness. You're trying to get a good grade that will make you happy when you don't deserve it. You don't merit that good grade. So the duty of justice rules out cheating in all walks of life, athletics, academics, and everywhere else, the working world. Don't cheat. Don't take more than your fair share. What if you're at a party and the person giving the party has provided just enough treats for all the guests and no more than that? Don't take two. Don't take more than your share. You're leaving someone without a treat or with only part of a treat. So, when you teach your children, don't take more than their share of something. You're trying to instill a sense of justice in your child, right? One treat per person. That's what's been allocated. Don't take more than that. You can take less than that. That's up to you. If you don't want the treat or if you want someone else to uh, have your treat, that's fine. Don't free ride on others. Do your fair share of the work. In, a, in any kind of cooperative activity, right? Uh, do your fair share. What if 10 people are trying to push a vehicle out of the mud or pull a vehicle out of the mud with a rope? Don't pretend to be pulling when you're not because you're shifting your share of the burden onto the other nine people or however many there are. So do your fair share. Maybe more if you can do it. And if you're a teacher, don't uh, give your B students an A unless it's done from mercy and don't give your A students a B. Right? That would be to bring about an unjust distribution. And finally, don't steal money from people or don't steal anything from people. If you steal something, that means you have no right to it and yet you're getting it anyway and you're depriving the other, the owner of his or her property without permission. So, 
don't steal because that would be to bring about an unjust distribution of the means to happiness. So the first aspect of justice out of five is don't do anything that brings about an unjust distribution. Don't act unjustly. Secondly, you writing these down? The second aspect of justice is prevent injustice if it's within your power to do so. For example, if you're a professor, don't allow your students to cheat. Monitor them. Watch over them. Now, it's going to depend on the kind of exam it is. If it's a classroom exam and you're there in class, keep your eyes open. Watch them. Look for the telltale signs of cheating. Students looking over like this at someone else's exam or perhaps looking at a hand. Maybe something's been written on the hand or a little piece of paper or something's been written on the table. So monitor your students, prevent injustices from occurring. Uh, if you're in a position to prevent someone from stealing someone's money, do so. What if you're in the library one day and um, you're sitting there studying and someone you don't even know is sitting across from you studying? Suppose that's going on for an hour or more. At some point you see someone, you see that person get up and leave, but leave his or her backpack there. Um, now what if someone, while that person is gone, comes up and reaches into the backpack and takes, let's say, a $20 bill? You are in a position to prevent that. You have reason to believe that that would be an unjust taking. And you are in a position to prevent it. You can say, for example, say to that person, excuse me, excuse me, uh, who are you that uh, I don't know you and that you, you appear to be taking someone else's money. So let's, you better stop, wait for the other person to come back and then we'll sort it out. The other person, that person who was trying to steal the money may run away, leaving the money. So you have prevented an injustice by intervening. The duty of justice has that as its second aspect. All right? So don't allow your students to cheat. Try to intervene and prevent theft. Those are both ways of preventing injustice. Third out of five, remove injustices that have already occurred. Remember, if you're preventing an injustice, it hasn't yet occurred. You're trying to keep it from happening. But what if it's already occurred? Well, there's still a duty of justice if you have it within your power to remove it. For example, if I discover that someone got a certain grade as a result of cheating, I will change that student's grade to make it conform to what the student deserves or merits. I may even go further as punishment for the cheating student and see to it that the student gets an F or is kicked out of the university for cheating. And that's what the student deserves, or arguably deserves, right? Some punishment for the cheating, which is a violation of the known rules. Um, what about, what if the money, the $20 bill, had been taken? What if the person came up, reached in the mat, backpack, took $20 and walked away? I, I get up, I apprehend the person, and I say, excuse me, is that your money? The person may hand me the money and then get away. Or there are other scenarios. Maybe I notify the authorities. The authorities make that person give the money back. So what I've done is I've intervened. An injustice occurred the moment that person took possession of the 20. I have intervened to see to it that the $20 got put back where it belongs. So we went from an injustice back to justice, right? You got your money back. The owner got his or her money back. All right, so that's removal of an injustice. Fourth, reduce injustice. Sometimes it's not possible to remove the injustice altogether and go back to the just state of affairs. All you can do is reduce the amount of the injustice. So for example, what if I saw someone steal $20, I got a good look at the person, um, an injustice has occurred. Later, I notice that person in the bookstore and I say, 
excuse me, I saw you take $20 uh, out of someone's neck backpack earlier today. The person may say, okay, look, you caught me red-handed. Um, I spent some of the money. I've got $5 left. Here you go. Well, if that happened and $5 of the stolen 20 got back to the owner, uh, we still got an injustice, but the amount of the injustice isn't as great as it was because I intervened. I helped recoup twenty um, five dollars for the victim. So I haven't I haven't prevented injustice. It did occur. I haven't removed it, but I did reduce the amount of it. Okay, that's the fourth aspect. The fifth aspect is affirmative. It it says act justly. Notice, number one said, don't act unjustly. The fifth one says, act justly. Do justice. It's an affirmative obligation to see to it that all the people you are interacting with get what they deserve. So, for example, uh, I would encourage people to take their fair share. Um, I would do, do my fair share. I would take turns. That's a form of justice. I would treat people in accordance with their desserts, for example, giving correct change to my customers, and so on. So be a just person as you live your life. Strive to get give everyone you interact with what exactly what he or she deserves. Okay, my final comment has to do with an historical example. I told you earlier that I love American history. You probably know about the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1803 to 1806. It was a military expedition. It was Captain Lewis, Meriwether Lewis, and, Lu and William Clark, two captains. They were co-leaders of the expedition. They took a group of uh, initially of 45 people or so um, up to what's now North Dakota, and they wintered there. In the spring, they sent some of them back to St. Louis on a keelboat because the river was getting narrower and the keelboat couldn't have gone much further. So they made smaller boats, and about 30 of them headed upriver on the Missouri River toward the Pacific coast. They crossed the Rocky Mountains, and got, they got on the Columbia River, which flows down to the ocean, and they wintered on the Pacific Ocean at the fort they called Astoria. I'm sorry, they called it Fort Clatsop. Fort Clatsop. As soon as spring came along, they headed back. They crossed the mountains again, and they went all the way back to St. Louis, floating down the Missouri River, this time with the current. So it's a three-year expedition. And amazingly, no one, I'm sorry, amazingly, only one person died. And he died, it was, uh, um, oh, I can't think of his name offhand, but he died from what we, what appears to be appendicitis. And he probably would have died with the best medical treatment uh, in, the, in a city like Philadelphia. So it's no fault of the expedition that he died. Um, anyway, um, well, his name was uh, Charles Floyd, I think, just for the record. Anyway, when the expedition ended, Lewis sent a letter to the Secretary of War, Henry Dearborn. And in that letter, Lewis described the merits and demerits of almost all the people who accompanied him on the three-year journey. And it's just an amazing document because it looks pretty clearly like Lewis was trying to do justice. There were certain people on the expedition who served well and did well, and Lewis singled them out and praised them for doing their duty and more, going beyond the scope of their duty. Other people in the expedition didn't do so well. They didn't even do their duty. So I'll just give you a flavor of this. This is uh, an actual transcription of Lewis's letter dated January 15, 1807, about a year after, well, several months after getting back on the expedition. Okay, I wish I could read more of this. It's just, it's a fascinating document. It gives me chills sometimes to read it. So here is what he wrote about certain people. And I'll start with Charles Floyd, the only man who died on the expedition. Lewis wrote, under Charles Floyd, deceased the 20th of August, 1804, a young man of much merit. 
His father, who now resides in Kentucky, is a man much respected, though possessed of but moderate wealth. As the son has lost his life while on this service, I consider his father entitled to some gratuity in consideration of his loss, and also that the deceased being noticed in this way will be a tribute but justly due to his merit. Wow. In one clause of one sentence, Lewis used the words justly, do, and merit. He wants to do right by Charles Floyd. Now, Charles Floyd is dead. You can't, you can't give him any sum of money that will matter to him. You can't, uh, what can you do? Well, his father's still alive. And his father gave his son to this, in this service, this important service, his father is a man much respected, but of moderate means. Lewis is saying the father should be, should receive something uh, in honor of his son's good service. And also, uh, we need to pay tribute to Charles Floyd uh, by uh, recognizing him. And I think just writing these words was Lewis's way of, for the historical record, saying this was a man of much merit and he deserves happiness, pleasure, recognition, fame, and so on. Okay, so that's Lewis saying, here's someone who deserves uh, good treatment. Now, let me find someone who deserves poor treatment. Um, there are a lot of them who's, who received good treatment. Now, you may know that there was a young woman, a girl, really, on the expedition, uh, the, the Corps of Discovery, as this expedition was known, picked her up over the winter at Fort Mandan in what is now North Dakota. Her name was Sacagawea. Some people pronounce it Sacagawea. She had been kidnapped as a child from the Shoshone tribe far out west in the mountains. They, she was brought back to live among the Mandans and Hidatsas on the Missouri River. She was only about 15 years old when Lewis and Clark met her she, was, she had been taken as the wife of a French-Canadian fur trader named Toussaint Charbonneau. And over the winter, she had given birth to a child named Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. Lewis and Clark wanted the services of her husband as an inter... I'm sorry. Lewis and Clark knew that when they reached the Rocky Mountains, uh, after they reached the source of the Missouri River, they knew they would need horses to get over the mountains until they found the Columbia River and could float down to the Pacific Ocean. So they knew that horses were essential later in the expedition. How do you get horses? Well, they knew they were going to have to bargain. They were going to have to dicker with a tribe of Indians to get the horses they need. They found out who the Indians were out there. They were Shoshones. Over the winter in Fort Mandan, they discovered that a girl named Sakagawea was a Shoshone, and she spoke the language. So they inquired about her going along with them so that when they reached the Rocky Mountains, she could translate between Lewis and Clark and her people, the Shoshones, then they could get the horses they needed. So they, they had a use for her, and that's the only reason they wanted her to go. And they were willing to take her and her baby along, get that. That's how badly they needed her services. Unfortunately for them, she was married to Charbonneau. And he was a, a no good person. He had some ability, abilities as an interpreter or translator. So Lewis and Clark made an arrangement whereby he would be hired and he would bring along his young wife and their baby. And they did accompany Lewis and Clark all the way to the Pacific and all the way back to Fort Mandan, Clark had so fallen in love with that baby boy, he called him my little pomp, Pompey, Clark begged her to let him take her son back to St. Louis and give him an education. And Sacagawea agreed to it. So Clark took the little boy, who was only a year or so old, back to St. Louis, raised him as his own, uh, he went on, Baptiste Charbonneau went on to be a great explorer and guide himself. He, was, he had a great life. He went to Europe and got a great education and so on. So um, Charbonneau 
Sacagawea's husband, didn't do so well on the expedition. Let me read what Lewis wrote about him. A man of no peculiar merit was useful as an interpreter only, in which capacity he discharged his duties with good faith from the moment of our departure from the Mandans until our return to that place August last and received as a compensation $25 per month while in service. So Lewis is saying he did, he was hired to interpret. He did that adequately. He did little or, little or nothing more than that when asked. Lewis is trying to get it right. Lewis, I want to go on the record for historical purposes. I want to say he did his duty, but nothing more. And I can tell you that uh, on one occasion, I've read the journals, the three-year journals, all the way through on a daily basis three times in my life. I'll probably do it again someday. It's wonderful stuff. There was an incident in which Charbonneau was in a boat. The boat, the, there was a storm blowing in with high winds. The boat had gotten sideways. This was a boat with all kinds of scientific instruments and papers in it. And if the boat had capsized, much of that equipment would have been lost, either sunk or floated down river, never to be recovered. Um, Charbonneau panicked. And during this tense incident, when the boat was in danger of capsizing, Charbonneau was standing up in the boat with his arms to the heavens, screaming to his God, Oh my God, we're all going to die. What are we going to the man in the boat with him, I think it was Lewis, pointed his gun at him and said, sit down and row or I will shoot you. So Charbonneau, who cared about his life, sat down and rowed, and luckily the boat didn't capsize. So he was useless. In a situation that called for calm head, he panicked. There are other occasions where the Corps of Expedition uh, reached the, its destination late in the evening in the dark, Everyone's tired, maybe it's raining and cold, and they need to get everything out of the boats, set up camp, cook their meals, get fires going, and so on. Charbonneau was asked, would you please help us unload the boats? And he said, no, I didn't hire on to do drudge work. I hired as an interpreter, it's all I'm gonna do. Obviously someone like that is not going to endear himself to the other members of the Corps, and he didn't. And Lewis repaid him when he wrote this. He said, look, he did his duty. I never had a problem with his translation. He always translated when I asked, but he didn't do anything else. He never helped us when, we, when it would have been nice for him to help us. And one more thing, according to Clark, he was abusive towards Sacagawea. And obviously that would not sit well with Clark, uh, who had a special affection for her um, and her child. Um, so they didn't like Charbonneau because he was what we would call a wife beater. By the way, when I say they had a special affection, um, Sacagawea knew that Clark's birthday was coming up. Uh, she knew when his birthday was, and she, she secretly made him a pair of moccasins with, uh, with, with beads, beautiful colored beads, very highly adorned, and on his birthday she presented them to Clark, and I'm sure he was very grateful for that. Okay, so that's Lewis. Um, let me just read, and this will be the last thing, I promise. Let me just read the last paragraph. This is where Lewis summarizes all of his detailed comments on all the men and women. He calls it general remark, and this does give me chills when I read it. By the way, Lewis would be dead within two years. Uh, he may have had some medical condition, perhaps bipolar disorder, untreated. Um, he had bouts of depression that were debilitating. Uh, anyway, uh, he was on his way to Washington with his horse, on his horse, with a servant and his papers, and um, he ended up dead in a cabin along the way. And to this day, there's a lively debate about whether he killed himself or was murdered. I lean toward the suicide myself, but it's interesting to look at arguments on both sides. So uh, this is written two years before he himself was dead. 
He said, with respect to all those persons whose names are entered on this roll, I feel a peculiar pleasure in declaring that the ample support which they gave me under every difficulty, the manly firmness which they had evinced on every necessary occasion, and the patience and fortitude with which they submitted to and bore the fatigues and painful sufferings incident to my late tour to the Pacific Ocean entitles them to my warmest approbation and thanks. Nor will I suppress the expression of a hope that the recollection of services thus faithfully performed will meet a just reward in an ample remuneration on the part of our government. So Lewis is pleading with the Secretary of War, please, I, I implore you, see to it that these men in Sacagawea get what they deserve, right? A just reward for their sacrifices, their sufferings, their labors, the danger to which they expose themselves on this three-year expedition. Please give them some land, whatever you can do, some compensation beyond their ordinary salary as privates in the army. Okay, so that's Meriwether Lewis. Um, I, I always get chills reading that because Lewis had this desire, it appears, to do justice. I don't know whether, I, I doubt he knew he would be gone in two years, but he wanted to get it on the record. He knew that this letter would be in the National Archives forever, and I'm sure it's still there somewhere. And he just wanted, while he had a chance, while the events of the expedition were fresh in his mind, he wanted to record for posterity the merits and demerits of each individual as he saw it. And that's a wonderful thing. He did justice, or tried to do justice to those individuals. Um, Having read through the journals three times, it's, a, it's an amazing story. I recommend to you that you acquire uh, maybe just the one volume abridgment of the journals, which you could read uh, in, in a few weeks probably. It's just an amazing story um, of endurance, hardship, accomplishment. Um, there were scenes that are mind-blowing. I mean, Lewis talking a man off the ledge when he's hundreds of feet above uh, the rocky bottom of the, of the uh, canyon or whatever you call it. Uh, he calmly talked the man. He said, okay, um, take your knife out of your pocket. The man is hanging on with his hand and, his, and one foot. He said, take your knife out of your pocket, stick it in the ground above your head for, so you get a hold. Now move your right foot very carefully up about a foot and you'll find a little depression in the rock, put it in there. And eventually the man was able to climb up and save his life. Amazing stories. Um, one thing I've learned from reading these journals is whenever I feel tempted to complain or whine about something, maybe I'm riding my bike and the rain has started falling and I'm cold and wet and miserable. You think about Lewis and Clark and you'll stop whining. Uh, the, the hardships they endured, an amazing, story. Okay, that's enough for today. I'm sorry I kept you late. I thought it would be a short lecture, but you know, when you get me going on American history or something, I can't stop. So the next lecture will be our final one. I think it'll be on Monday, and then we'll be done with all of our lectures. We will wrap up this handout. Um, we'll do the final three prima facie duties. Again, I'm sorry it took so long. I hope it wasn't too boring or terrible. I'll see you in a couple of days.